right. Last but not least, from uh, Mayo Anesthesia Critical Care, we have Benjamin Daxon who's going to talk to us today about APRV. Am I, am I required to make fun of someone in my talk? Is that, is that a prerequisite? Can you guys hear me okay? Is this okay? So good morning, my name is Ben Daxon. I'm one of the Anesthesia Critical Care Fellows for Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And in my experience, the mode, APRV, uh, has generated a lot of controversy whenever it's recommended. There's always a nice discussion about pulmonary physiology, but the conversation always ends the same way with somebody saying, there's just no evidence for it. Well, it's not like we haven't studied this thing, so I wanted to look at the literature and see if we can find an answer to the question, should we be using APRV? I have no disclosures to make, but I should say we are running into a proverbial tornado of controversy. This literature is contentious, some of it is obscure, and I very well may say something you find ridiculous. Whatever questions you have, save them and find me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about them. I hope that guy's okay. So here's every study I could find on APRV. Now we're going to whittle this down real quick to just prospective randomized controlled trials in humans in English that use agreed upon modern ventilatory settings. And we're going to limit it to adults. Now full disclosure, that one study I just removed was in pediatrics and showed an increase in mortality with APRV. But I was actually so befuddled by some of the findings and management of the mode that I actually wrote a letter to the editor about it, and it's referenced in your slide sets if you want to uh, know why I don't think that finding is generalizable. So let's take our two studies in reverse order. The first is Hirschberg. 2018 took 52 patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure, split them up into a low tidal volume group, an APRV group, and this APRV hybrid where they tweak some of the settings to try and have smaller release volumes. Unfortunately, they had to stop the trial early because they couldn't recruit enough patients. But what really caught everybody's attention was this figure in graph. It shows that the low tidal volume group had consistent tidal volumes around six milliliters per kilogram, but the APRV and APRV hybrid groups had much larger tidal volumes. In fact, if you look at the bottom of the table, you'll see that on day five, the APRV arm had release volumes, which is the ventilator tidal volume, over 10 milliliters per kilogram, and the APRV hybrid arm had over 15 milliliters per kilogram. And if you're really astute, if you look, that x-axis is not crossed when patients are breathing with 20 milliliters per kilogram release volumes. That is insane. But a funny thing happened on the way to APRV's demise. If you look at the results, APRV actually beat out the low tidal volume group in almost every metric. What's happening here? So if you're going to answer the question, should we be using APRV? No, because it results in injurious tidal volumes. You can't cite this study where APRV resulted in less injury. So again, what's going on here? Well, here's one study that may help. A group out of upstate New York took a bunch of rats, injured their lungs, and split them up into an ARDSNET protocol with varying levels of PEEP and an APRV protocol with varying lengths of T-low. They then looked at the lungs under the microscope, circled the alveoli, colored in the extra alveolar space, and compared the difference between inspiration and expiration. And what they found was that in the ARDSNET group, as you increase the PEEP, you increase the alveolar stability, so that when they had a PEEP of 24, the alveoli only changed 7%. No surprise. In the APRV arm, they found a similar trend. As they shortened the T-low, the alveoli also became more stable. So when they set their T-low to end, when the peak expiratory flow rate had decayed to 75%, the alve alveoli also only changed 7%. But here's what's fascinating. In the ARDSNET group, they had tidal volumes of 5 milliliters per kilogram. But in the APRV arm, they had over double the tidal volume. What's going on? Well, if we could zoom into the lungs and actually look at the alveoli in real time, we might see that they're telling us something different than the ventilator. In other words, even though the ventilator is saying we're delivering injurious tidal volumes, the alveoli might actually be very safe and stable. Conversely, the alveoli may be suffering adelect trauma, opening and collapsing, while the ventilator is saying we're delivering lung protective ventilation. Now, everybody in this room understands this concept because you think about it every time you consider the blood pressure and the microcirculation. The macro parameter and the micro parameter do not necessarily correlate. Now, when and why this macro micro discrepancy happens in the lungs is a whole other talk, and we have one other study to get to. This is Zhu and colleagues, 2017, 138 patients with ARDS split up into an APRV and low tidal volume group. And in every metric, uh, APRV beat out low tidal volume, and significantly so. In fact, if one more patient had lived in APRV or one more patient had died in the low tidal volume group, you would have had a statistically significant difference in ICU mortality of 15%. That's incredible. But there's some problems here. Oh, before I get to that, this was statistically significant, and this really caught everyone's attention, the difference in ventilation liberation rates. 
these two lines differ early, significantly, and consistently. But here's some problems. That control arm had a really low rate of paralysis, recruiting, and proning. There's also concerns that they didn't get enough attention, they had a different sedation protocol. But all these critiques really amount to the same thing. It's not that APRV did so well, it's that the control arm did so bad. And it turns out that critique's true. If you look at the control arm and compare it to the FACT trial, the EXPRESS trial, or the LOVES trial, you can see they just didn't do very well. But if you're willing to accept this comparison, you may need to be prepared to accept that APRV still did really well. Oh, one more important point. That low rate of paralysis recruiting and proning, it was actually even lower in the APRV group. There is absolutely a place for paralysis in APRV, and there is no reason proning wouldn't have benefited those patients either. Okay, so two studies, big whoop. Well, I only have seven minutes here. If you'd given me more time, I could have told you about Lim, who in 2016 showed that the 52 patients who were referred to their center for ECMO but were put on APRV first, only two required uh, ECMO. I could have told you about Hannah and Roy, who separately showed that in their lung transplant patients who were ventilated with APRV pre-explant, they actually did better. And I could have told you about Andrew's study, who in 2013 showed that at their trauma center, despite having one of the highest injury severity scores, had one-fourth and one-tenth the mortality and incidence of ARDS when they compared their trauma patients to other centers when they had used APRV. In fact, if we went through every single study that's ever been done on APRV, except for that pediatric one I mentioned at the very beginning, there is not a single study that shows a statistically significant worse outcome with APRV. That's over 68,000 patients. So should we be using APRV? Yes, because the literature supports it. And that guy lived. Thank you.